Welcome to Around BCC. I'm Keith Thibault. We have another full slate of information for you here on Around BCC this month, including a new segment which we think you'll really enjoy. But first, we're going to start with our BCC in-depth segment. Our in-depth segment is a segment where we take a closer look at some of the issues and events and programs here at Bristol Community College. BCC is known for its support system for its students. We hear a lot about how BCC helps students who need extra help in the classroom. But there are also occasions where BCC takes students who are gifted, who are seeking challenges, and they also provide those challenges for those gifted students. One such example of this is the college's Commonwealth Honors Program. And we're going to take a look at that today with our three guests. To my immediate left is the director of the program, Tom Grady. And two students that are either in the program or were in the program at one point, Michael Silva and Sandy Pavo Pinaretta. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Tom, tell us a little bit about what the Commonwealth Honors Program is and uh, maybe a little bit about the guidelines and how students get involved. Well, the program is an academic program and it's in addition to any student's associate's degree program to enhance it. And the primary mission of it is to provide students that are high performing and who are intellectually curious to have a a one-on-one -on -one relationship, a more mentor-like relationship with faculty who are have interest in their area of expertise so they can explore something in more depth and have a uh, rewarding experience as students and learners. Now these, um, these experiences, are they, um, do students actually earn credits for this or is this uh, above and beyond what they would, obviously above and beyond what they have in their, their program requirements. So what kind of, what kind of credits do students receive? Well, there are a variety of credits. They have to have four honors experiences, but they're very diverse. It could be that they're in, say, a psychology class, and they're really interested in that course, and they might approach the professor to do something in addition to the course, and that would be an honors component. So it wouldn't be extra credit, but it would show up in their transcript that um, intro to psychology would be an honors component course. Mm -hmm. So they were doing something extra that they're interested in. Um, or it could be credit bearing with an honors seminar, which is an interdisciplinary course that's three credits, usually within the humanities, that is designed for honors students only. It's usually at the sophomore level. And then finally, there's a culminating honors project in which a uh, faculty mentor shepherds that individual student through uh, a credit-bearing project that is of their own interest and maybe outside of the box of uh, what's offered at the college. Mm -hmm. So those are the three types of experiences and they need four total to graduate. What are the, uh, what's the criteria for students to meet in order to be you know, accepted, accepted. Or accepted into the program? Uh, typically they need um, a GPA of 3.5 mm -hmm. to get into the program and then it's sort of diverse. It could be that they had a B plus average in high school or they were in the top 20 percent of high school, that they've had 12 credits here at BCC with that GPA, that they have transfer credit, um, that they tested well to get into the college, or that they just come highly recommended by a faculty or a guidance counselor from their high school. How many students are currently in the program? Well, I just had a big email blast that just got a flurry of uh, um, entrants. So I would say that we are about 120, 130 are in the program mm -hmm. right now. Now, these experiences, do they coincide with the academic calendar, meaning that, that they, they should probably start beginning the semester end at the end of the semester, or can mm -hmm. they start mid-semester? They typically, we, we encourage students to do it at the beginning of the semester with the components because where the mission is, is that one-on-one -on -one experience working with a faculty member. The, you know, if you start at the beginning of the semester, the more time you'll have with that faculty member to really sort of learn what it's like to work with someone who is well-heeled in a subject area that you have interest in. But they can happen mid-semester, the components anyway. But they usually happen in concurrent with whatever the student's associate's degree program is. This follows along with it. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms <coughs> of uh, the benefits to students, uh, what are those benefits? Well, they have that experience of being validated and really having one-on-one -on -one experience with faculty. Beyond that, um, there's always, they have all of their activities are designated on their transcript. 
Some students don't graduate as CHP scholars, they do, but they like the experience of having a couple of experiences with CHP, and that will always be on their transcript. But if they finish, mm -hmm. it will say that they're a Commonwealth Honors Scholar on their transcript. They'll get to have, pardon me, automatic admittance to any university or state college um, in the Commonwealth, as well as admittance into their Commonwealth Honors Program. They um, they get a lot of laudits at graduation um, that I won't go into, the, but, but the, they also get um, a scholarship of remission of 15 credits of in-state tuition to them, which essentially adds up to $1,845 mm -hmm. is given to them at graduation as well. So it's a very uh, enticing program for it students, is. especially the students who leave BCC to go to further their education elsewhere. Absolutely, and it looks really great if you're if you're trying to get into a competitive private college, because we do get students into Harvard and Brown and Ivies and sub Ivies, mm. and it looks great that way too. Plus, we have um, uh, an honors lounge that's dedicated for honors students only that has uh, computers and a printer and a large table to work at and comfortable furniture. So that's also a benefit as well. Mm. So they have a nice place to work that's dedicated to them. Let's talk to the two students now. Michael, let's start with you. Uh, what, um, how did you find out about the program, and how did it interest you, and, and why did you get involved? Uh, actually, I think Tom was the person who introduced me to, to the program, I mm -hmm. think. He suggested it to me in my second semester, I think. Mm -hmm. What was your interest in, in getting involved in, in doing things? What were some of the projects that you worked on? Uh, some of the projects? Yeah, some of the, the experiences. Well, I, I, I did most of my honors work with Tom. Mm -hmm. I did a component. I did, um, what was it? I did my final culminating project. Mm -hmm. And I, I, beside that, I took an, an honors course, which is uh, remembering the Holocaust. What were some of the details of so, some of those components? What was the component? What, what did you do? The component was for uh, postmodern, plus postmodernism. Okay. And I did an experimental piece of short fiction. Okay. What do you hope to do after your years here at BCC? Now, I understand that this is your last semester here. You last semester. You'll be graduating yeah. in December. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you hope to, to do after BCC? Uh, transfer. To any, you have a I'm applying to one school this semester. Okay. That's at Amherst College. All right. And your major here is general studies, correct? Mm -hmm. But yeah. what do you hope to major when you... Uh, English for sure. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do a double major, though. Okay. And it's either going to be film or uh, political science. All right. Sandy, how about you? What, what, uh, what was your introduction to the Honors Program, and uh, what were some of the benefits that you saw in, in taking part? Again, it was Professor Grady. He um, approached a class that was in English, 12. And um, he offered that option. I thought it was a great option to do something. At that time, I didn't know what my project would be. But then it ended up being a project that I could bring my psychology in with the English, which I thought was really cool that you could mix the two. So I ended up doing a project using positive psychology and looking at literature through that lens. Now, you're, um, you're also a general studies major here at BCC. Yes. What do you hope to do after, after your BCC? I years? hope to continue on and get my bachelor's degree in nursing and psychology. So are you in the nursing program here as well? No, I actually have just been accepted somewhere else. Okay, so you'll be getting your nursing degree where? Uh, at Massasoit. Massasoit Community College? Yes. And then hopefully you'll continue on to get your bachelor's degree as well? Correct. That's very, very ambitious. Tom, how does, uh, how, how does you as, as the director <coughs> get the word out to other faculty and staff here at the college to say, hey, if you have any you know, bright students to get involved, mm -hmm. this would be a good thing to do? Well, one of the things that, um, when I came on as director, I came on in last November, is I wanted to use uh, technology as um, a primary form of communication for the whole program, because I think it really serves our students, because they're, they're more savvy than someone in my generation. But I, I hit the pavement when it came to um, using faculty to recruit students and to get them interested. So I just you know, hightailed it to a bunch of division meetings and did my dog and pony act in front of all gathered faculty. But I also put out an email blast and um, I did that for students and for faculty to remind them about the program and how it works. And uh, the email blast to students had much more of a 
um, benefit than I thought mm -hmm. because I do a, a mail out version. That was the previous uh, method was to send out individual mailers to students who met the GPA by running a program to find out who was eligible. Mm -hmm. But the email thing just had incredible, because students read email, and maybe five years ago they didn't. Mm -hmm. But now that's, they're just more savvy with that interface than me pounding the pavement. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture of mail, uh, me showing up to faculty, uh, recruiting students at, um, at orientation. I'll stand up in front of liberal arts. Those are typically the programs. Liberal arts and general studies are the main feeders. But we have nurses and we have engineers. All programs are represented. Now, how um, the, the college does a lot and <coughs> has done in the, in the past few years, and it's growing, uh, uh, service learning type opportunities. Mm -hmm. Is this another way to tie in maybe an honors project with community service? Is that possible? Absolutely. We, we're trying to make strong connections with other enhancement programs at the college, like um, uh, there's the Presidential Scholars Program, there's Phi Theta Kappa, mm -hmm. and service learning. Where service learning and honors have a really great marriage is when you can take what you're doing in service learning and add scholarship to it. So if you're running, say, a voting booth, then maybe you can do research on trends of Generation Y voters and what are what is the theory behind why students are not uh, registering to vote, and and that accompanying piece to the actual civic duty of setting up the voting booth shows a really terrific marriage of honors and scholarship. Mm -hmm. Another student did something really cool where they looked into the psychological impacts of being a family member to someone who's in Iraq, and so she wanted to set up a um, communique for folks to have a connection at a, um, at a practical level that people could connect and find out and dispel myths, but also do scholarship about the actual psychological um, conditions that happen to people who have post-traumatic stress by proxy of having people in the military over in Iraq. Mm. You mentioned how you try to spread the word. It's important to get some of the alumni or future alumni of, the, of this program to maybe spread the word and some people that they may run into either um, since the program here at BCC is about what six seven years old yes said. yeah um, you may have someone like uh, Michael and, and Sandy who may have siblings who you know hey if you go to BCC you may want to get part of that is that an important component as well as spreading the word I I know that word of mouth happens with alumni but it's probably something I should put more energy into because mm -hmm. I don't work closely with the Alumni Association. But I know that that's the best way to spread, to enhance any program is from person to person rather than sending out email queries. I mean, it's the best way. But, um, well, I would hope you would talk to your, <laughs> to your sibs and your friends about it. And those type of referrals do come in. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of the best ones because when students hear from a fellow student or an alumni that this is really what it's like and they know that person, mm -hmm. then they have a lot of trust in what that process is going to be like instead of coming at it cold. If someone has any questions about the program, how can they get in touch with you? Um, if you go to the BCC website yep. and look under academics, there'll be a link to honors which will describe the program a little bit and then it will have a link to my email and that's probably the best way is to right. have a conversation about it a little bit as well as um, uh, you can call me. It's, right. I'm on the call. 2811 <laughs> <laughs> extension. Extension 2488. 2488. All right, Tom, Michael, Sandy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and and good much. luck in your future endeavors. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Up next on Around BCC, BCC has a lot of vocal supporters, none more so than our alumni. We just spoke about it in the last segment. Well, here and around BCC, we have a new segment where we're going to take a look at some of the alumni and the great work they're doing in our community. Here's the initial segment of Alumni in Your Community. Hi, I'm Joanne Bentley. I'm a graduate of BCC, class of 1980. I pretty much always wanted to be an architect, even as a little kid. I was always 
drawing pictures of you know, dog houses and bird houses and then trying to make them myself and and just do things like that and it was just I I think my approach to architecture is it's like a puzzle to me which I love I love puzzles and it's I enjoy talking to people finding out what they need taking the pieces of their puzzle and putting them together and giving them a building or a space that they really like so I it's just something that was always in the back of my mind since I was a little kid and I just didn't really think I was going to be able to do it. Um, and honestly, I attribute a lot of me being able to do that to BCC. When I started there in 77, it was actually a very comfortable place for me. The campus was very comfortable. I didn't live too far away and I was familiar with the campus because all through high school I used to go and use the library there anyway. So it was a very um, homey, comforting feeling for me to go to BCC, the campus. I was familiar with the buildings. Uh, there's a lot more now than there were when I was there, but I, um, I just liked the whole experience. The campus was great. It felt kind of like you weren't in Fall River because you had this great facility and all these buildings, except um, it, was just, it was just nice. It was kind of woodsy and it was just a great campus at the time. When I started at BCC, I was in the liberal arts program, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I, actually, I should say, I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to get there. I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I couldn't really afford to go to any of the private colleges that were around here, so I knew I would have to do something else first. So I started in the liberal arts program, and then at the end of my first year, I went and spoke with a couple of advisors who suggested I switch to the civil engineering program, which I did. And that was a very different experience for me, uh, even though it, you know, we were approaching the 80s, it was still, engineering was still a very male dominated field. And um, I switched into that starting, which, which would have been my second year at BCC, into the engineering program. I was the only girl in the majority of my classes, even my physics class, there, were only, there was only one other girl in that. And it was, but the guys just treated me like one of the guys. It was um, no big deal to them that I was the only girl in engineering at the time. And then I realized um, if I just took a few more classes, I was able to get a second degree. So I ended up getting a degree in engineering, civil engineering, and then also one in land surveying. The faculty at BCC, once I got into the engineering program, was great. Not that they weren't great previously, but the classes were small. Most of my engineering classes, we only had eight or nine or ten people at the most. And I think anybody at that time who was at BCC in engineering probably had Fred Hannock. And I had him for the majority of my classes. And we were pretty much, there, there was a group of about eight of us that went through all our classes together and we had Mr. Hannock for a lot of our classes and he was a hard taskmaster. And he demanded a lot from us, but we had a rivalry going on, but it was an academic rivalry. So we were all motivated to succeed and do very well in our classes. And he would talk to us about what our plans were for the future and what we were gonna do and where we were gonna work. And even though he wasn't our advisor, he kind of became our advisor and really helped us. After BCC, I ended up working for four years. I wanted to continue in engineering or architecture, but I needed, I needed money to do that. So I left BCC and I worked for the Department of Public Works for a year. And then I went for, to an engineering company in Middleborough, Mass, and I worked there for another three years before finally applying to different colleges for architecture. And I went to Rhode Island School of Design and got my architecture degree from them. I, I actually ended up receiving two degrees. One was a Bachelor of Fine Arts and then a Bachelor of Architecture from RISD. While I was at RISD, I started working for one of my professors who's a structural engineer in Providence and I worked for him uh, my last year at RISD and then stayed for six years after graduation working for him. And During that time, I started my process of becoming a licensed architect which is taking an exam. Also had two kids in the meantime, so that kind of slowed down the process for me. Um, so I wasn't really pushing to do that. So I, I worked in Providence for seven years. Then I came back to Fall River 
and worked for an architect here for the next 12 and a half years. And one of the reasons coming back to Fall River was um, I had two little kids. I live in Somerset and it was convenient when they were home, when they were sick, when they needed to go to graduation for nursery school. Uh, it was much easier, even though Providence isn't that far away, it was nice to come back to Fall River and um, start growing some of my roots again back here. I'm from Fall River. I was born and raised in Fall River. Some of my family is still here and I wanted to get back to Fall River. Starting my own business was um, a great experience and a scary experience at the same time. I really had no business background so I really didn't know kind of what I was doing. One thing that was a tremendous, tremendous help for me is that I'm in the Rotary Club and there are a lot of people who are just so willing to help you. And I, I had a lot of help from some accountants who, this is what you need to do and sign this paper and do this and do that. And just um, people in the community who are in Rotary are just very helpful people. And they were very supportive of me and you can do this and don't worry and things are gonna be great. And um, they've been great and they've been scary and it's been, I've been very, very fortunate. I've got um, good clients and I've got a good support system and it's just, it's working out well for me. BCC really helped me get where I am today. I really honestly believe I, I would not have been able to go back to school if I hadn't gone to BCC first. It was just um, a very affordable thing for me at the time. I wanted to go to college and I couldn't, I couldn't afford to go anyplace else. It was an affordable solution for me. The best thing was that all my credits that I took there transferred, and they would have transferred to any college that I went to. And it was just, it just worked out so well for me. It was a small campus, or it is a small campus compared to some of the others. It's a very friendly feeling when you're there on campus. You can navigate your way around. The faculty are great. The Advisors are great. They help you. They give you good advice. You know, if you don't know where something is, they'll find the answer for you. But I, I really, really, really believe that if I hadn't gone there first, I would, I would never have gone back to RISD or any other school. Our thanks go out to Joanne Bentley, and we wish her all the best in her future endeavors. We're going to continue this series of focusing on alumni, so stay tuned to Around BCC as we profile more alumni in your community. Time now for our BCC student segment. This month, our students take a look at student clubs on campus. Hello, and welcome to Student to Student. I'm Ben Farabee. Today I have here with me Kathy Burns from the Student Life Office to talk to us about student life and clubs here at BCC. Hi, Ben. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, what's the function of student life here at Bristol Community College. The Office of Student Life is involved with co-curricular activities. We create them, we promote them, and try to encourage students to get involved with any kind of co-curricular activities, um, especially student governance and club activities. Oh, okay. Now what club, uh, clubs are new to Bristol Community College this year? We're at the beginning of that process. All the clubs are just starting to pass in all their paperwork, so I'm not exactly sure which ones are new, um, so I'll go by last year's. And last year, Rotorac was, the, um, was a new club, and they've just done amazing things. They are the stepchild of the Rotary Club of Fall River, and they've done a ton of community service. They've um, raised funds for um, every kind of disaster that's gone on in, in the United States. They collected bicycles to send to Honduras. They've just done amazing things. Um, they're probably the newest, most active club. I see. That's very nice of them. Now, what's the process you need to go through to start a club here at BCC? OK. If anybody wants to start a club, you can. Um, it is very simple. The process is a matter of doing some paperwork, which the Office of Student Life does help with. Um, the first thing they have to do is get a faculty or staff advisor. Second thing is they needed at least three or four students. They need to put together the bylaws, what we call the constitution, 
which makes, scares people away, I think, but we like them to understand it's very basic. Like Article 1 is membership, Article 2, when the meetings are, it's very basic. But it's that we have a document to share with other students who might be interested in the club. They need to have elections, they need to have a president, a vice president, an officer, and a secretary. And then there's different things that were mandated by the state. Um, they, all club members have to sign off on the anti-hazing policy, anti-alcohol policy. We put all that in a file, we call you a club. We bring that to the Senate, and the Senate deposits some seed money. Um, last year it was $150 just for doing the paperwork, and that's just to kind of get you started. We really encourage clubs to fundraise, but we like to give them that initial little bit of money for cooperating with us and doing the paperwork that they need to do. Oh, doesn't sound too bad. What are some of the lesser known clubs here at Bristol Community College? Well, there's some that don't do that paperwork that <laughs> I don't necessarily advertise. I don't think of them as a recognized club, but some of them have been around longer than I've been around. Um, one of them is Socrates Cafe. Um, it is with Greg Maravallis, and um, he just talks about philosophical things. It could, you know, he, he thinks of a topic, sends it out, and people just meet once a month and talk about some of these kind of things. Um, some of the other clubs that might not be as well known to the college community are very well known to the club. The program clubs, we have a lot of clubs that are associated with programs, like the nursing club, um, the, the office management club, you know, you don't hear of them much, but almost everybody in the program does indeed yeah. belong to it or know about it. Okay. Athletics is something that are popping up little by little here at BCC. How is our highly publicized soccer team doing? Soccer team's doing great. They just finished their season 10-2-1. Wow. So, yeah, they have, um, it's funny. Our soccer team is a club. It's not a team yet. We're leaning, we're, we're leaning towards um, having varsity sports, but the state of the state, it wasn't the responsible thing to do, even though it's, it's very much requested, very much wanted. Um, there's a lot of our students who go to other schools because we didn't have athletics. Um, so we did a bit of an experiment with, with soccer. Uh, and it's really kicked off. We're playing other schools. We actually belong to the same league as if we were a varsity sport. And we're at the top of the, the game. We, we, uh, we're beating people that are um, ranked nationally. Um, we just beat somebody that, that was um, ranked fifth in the nation. We, our team is fantastic. I think that that's going to help us because delve into varsity sports. Yeah, because we also recognized. have a field hockey team that's been very active for girls. We're looking at women's soccer, and I'm not sure what, what other one. We'd like to start off soon. Hopefully, we'll be getting our part-time athletic director to start organizing some of these activities and putting us more professionally forwards. Oh, that's good, and I hope it, it works out for the soccer team, yes, and congratulations to them. Okay, Kathy, I'd like to thank you for your time here on Student to Student. You're welcome. Okay, and I'm Ben Farabini for Student to Student. I'll see you next time. That'll do it for Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. We leave you today with a look back at Constitution Day held here at BCC last September. We'll see you next month. All right, let's do this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending its freedom in its maximum hour of need. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, and the devotion, devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light this country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man 